I've had the good fortune to have an athletic career that has uh, spanned through six decades of my life. This means that I've gotten to race through the joys of puberty, my fertile years, pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, and postmenopause, all while also dealing with the inevitable effects of aging. And I have to tell you, it has been a wild ride. So I was born in 1961. That's my wild ride. <laughs> I was born in 1961. Title IX was passed uh, when I was just 11 years old, so I got to um, take advantage of a lot of the new opportunities for girls who were interested in sports. And um, my younger sisters and I all got to benefit from those new opportunities. My older sisters had very few opportunities to compete in, in uh, high school sports. So I took full advantage and jumped into every sport I could, along with millions of other girls who um, got to choose sports in the ensuing decades. So while opportunities for women in sports have skyrocketed, something else that's very important has lagged behind, and that is advice specifically for female athletes. So don't believe me? In 1972, we were still trying to dispel the belief that if a woman ran a marathon, her uterus might fall out. Uh, thankfully, we've come a long way since then. And, uh, but there are still most sports studies on sports performance. Uh, do not include female participants, and they don't study female issues. So a lot of us early beneficiaries of Title IX had to learn things the hard way. Even now, information can be very hard to come by, and um, a lot of the information is not accessible to doctors and coaches. And uh, even worse yet, a lot of the stuff is just taboo. People don't want to talk about it in public. So I thought today I'm going to share some uh, interesting stories of racing while female. So let's start with puberty. So male athletes, as they hit puberty, have the performance-enhancing benefits of getting stronger muscles, more strength, and getting leaner. Women, when they hit puberty, get to have wider hips, an increase in body fat, increasing size of their breasts, and a visit from what was surely nicknamed by a male in marketing, our friend once a month, which came along with cramps and bloating and nausea and the need to visit a bathroom every four hours to avoid disaster. I remember my first swimming championships that happened to fall on the same weekend as my period, and I worriedly asked my mother if it was going to hurt my performance. And her reply was, Karen, Women have set records and won world championships at every phase of their menstrual cycle. So, in other words, don't make excuses and try to remain optimistic and just do your best. So, I remember stuffing my body into my, uh, stuffing my, body into my bathing suit and giving it my best shot. And I didn't have a particularly good weekend of racing, uh, but I did try not to make excuses. When I became a triathlete doing races that were up to nine hours long, I had to come up with different strategies to cope when it was that time of the month. So I tried things like doubling up on the internal protection so that I could skip a few bathroom runs during the nine hours, or keeping an uh, extra tampon in the transition area so that uh, if there was an emergency, I could run in. But then again, I had to weigh that with the possible loss in prize money by spending an extra minute in the porta potty. So I have to say that male and female triathletes, we do learn how to pee on the bike during the Ironman to save time, so that calculation kind of just comes with the territory. I remember on one four and a half hour race that it was point to point, so when I got to the finish line, I knew the only thing I would have with me was basically my race number. So I taped a little OB tampon to the back of the race number so that I would have it at the finish line. So. We didn't actually carry purses when we raced. <laughs> so it worked out perfectly. When I got to the finish line, I had won the race, and it just so happens that the drug tester was there to meet me to ask me if I was ready to be escorted to the bathroom for my urine sample. Yes, right away, please. <laughs> and that race, it was actually a world championship. So the optimism strategy actually paid off. Now we know that estrogen and progesterone levels vary a lot during different phases of your menstrual cycle. And they can and do have an effect on performance. Some of these fluctuations can be mitigated by diet and it's, 
attention to uh, your training structure. Uh, and there are now apps that can actually help you to track that and study the um, effects of it on your training and racing. And we're getting more research all the time and hopefully we will do better in the future. And it gives girls and women even more reason to be optimistic about how they'll do at different phases of the month. When I was 26, I learned about a health issue that is way too common with menstruating athletes. I had just done my first marathon, which involved a big increase in my training. And um, I had qualified for the Olympic trials, surprisingly enough. So I embarked on my next marathon within a six month period. And I shortly started feeling very um, short of breath on my hard runs. And I was so worried that I went to the doctor and asked him if something might be wrong with my lungs. And his uh, expert reply was um, that my problem was probably that I was just getting older and that I was just too um, going to slow down now from now on. So I was 26 years old. <laughs> And uh, since then, we have learned that uh, the average age of women that have won the Ironman since 1994 is in the 30s. So I am uh, very happy to report that he was woefully mistaken about the peak age of female endurance athletes. So fortunately, I also complained about my symptoms to a, a coach, a running coach, who was quite knowledgeable and experienced. And he right away recognized what my real problem was, and it was that I was iron deficient. And so he sent me to another doctor who was a little bit better and right away did a blood test, which diagnosed my problem. So I started on iron supplements and I was um, changed a little bit of my diet. And within a few months, I was pretty much back to 100%. But in the meantime, I decided to jump into that Olympic trials marathon because I didn't know if I'd ever get that opportunity again. And I'm pleased to say that just by increasing my iron a little bit for that short amount of time, but also the knowledge that I wasn't crazy or too old, freed me up to be able to run a five minute PR in that race. So low iron is so prevalent among female athletes, even today with more knowledge about it, it can be sometimes 25 to 50% of female menstruating athletes that have trouble with this low iron. And it's a huge detriment to performance because iron is responsible for carrying oxygen in your blood and it also causes fatigue and, um, and can inhibit recovery. So I've personally spoken to many girls and women and right away recognized their symptoms just like that coach did for me and recommended that they'd get tested and they've subsequently been diagnosed. So hopefully that is something that now that we have a lot more information on the internet, if you know what to search for, um, things will be getting better in that regard. But back in the 80s, when I had a question to be answered, um, I couldn't go to the internet to just Google something like, how do I find a bike saddle that will allow me to bike a 100 mile bike ride and not want to abstain from sex for the next six weeks afterwards? <laughs> so I had to just experiment and also asked my fellow competitors for their advice. And one of my good friends told me that what she did was during the Ironman, she would grab a sponge from the aid station and she would put it in the crotch of her bathing suit for a little extra padding and um, regularly exchange it for a new one when that one got dried out and kind of too hot. So I just wanted to kind of let you know that for the next time you're in a race and they're <laughs> handing out reused sponges. <laughs> So for me, I just went through a lot of painful bike rides until I finally found a saddle that was made by a woman for women. It was called Terry Saddles. And this was life-changing for me. Um, the, the, this had a life-saving or, or a very important cutout in just the right place for me. And it had a little bit more padding on the nose of the saddle um, where I had the most pressure. And then it was also wider in back for our wider hips, um, unlike a lot, most of the men's saddles that were standard on the bikes at that time for both men and women. Uh, every woman's anatomy is a little bit different, though. And the important thing is that you recognize that and that you keep trying different saddles. So if you're uncomfortable, if you're a cyclist and you're not happy with your saddle, keep trying. There's a lot more options out there these days. Uh, but just a little word of warning. I saw a survey that 100% of pro women cyclists are still uncomfortable on their bike saddle. So don't be too optimistic that you're going to find something that's 100%. So in my 30s, I was kind of at the peak of my career. 
Um, I was earning prize money and um, getting appearance fees and had some really good sponsorship. Um, but my newfound bike saddle comfort actually had me entertaining the idea of having a baby. Now, male athletes, when they want to have a family, they don't miss a beat. Female athlete, on the other hand, is the baby carrying vessel. So I had to find a time voluntarily where I would halt all my prize money for the time being, convince my sponsors to maybe keep sponsoring me even though I wasn't racing, to put on 30 pounds, to pop out a baby, and then hopefully get back to my former level of competition all while taking care of said baby. Fortunately, well, as luck would have it, I'll say, um, an accident with a storm glass window kind of presented a maternity leave for me. I don't know if I ever would have found it voluntarily. Uh, if anybody needs any advice on um, how to conceive while uh, you have a cast all the way up to your top of your leg, um, you can DM me or my husband after this. My daughter was born after a 48-hour labor and a cesarean section. Um, I was very excited to test out my new pain threshold <laughs> by returning to racing. So I began to stockpile breast milk so I wouldn't have to wean her if I had to be away for a few days for races. And I can attest that pumping plus nursing is an excellent way to lose weight. However, it doesn't leave much time for training or anything else. <laughs> so at only three months after her birth, I may have rusted a little bit to get back to my first race, but it was the Goodwill Games in New York City, and it was just too exciting to pass up. The logistics of nursing Jenna before the start with an extra jog bra, bathing suit, and a wetsuit was a little bit tricky, but my husband and I managed it in a car parked on a New York City street near the start. If you haven't figured out that triathletes aren't very modest, you, you probably know it now. <laughs> Uh, I discovered quickly, though, that I had overestimated my return to fitness in such a competitive field, and I found myself in last place entering the, starting the run in Central Park. And as I ran by, my parents and my husband, uh, my dad was holding my now screaming infant daughter, and he held her up as I ran by, and he yelled, hurry up, your daughter needs you. <laughs> Real helpful, Dad. <laughs> Well, I had a record of never dropping out of a race, but at that moment, I thought, oh my gosh, I can really justify this now. And this was just as I was about to get lapped by the leaders of the field, which was kind of embarrassing. Um, but I thought about it. I knew that I just fed her two and a half hours ago, so I knew she wasn't actually hungry, and that if I dropped out at that moment, it was going to be purely for pride. So I stuck to it and finished that race. I swallowed my pride. Sometimes unbridled optimism can get you a little bit in trouble. However, when I won my eighth national championship three years later in that same Central Park, it tasted that much sweeter after having eaten that humble pie. <laughs> so eventually, we had a second child. And I was pleased that the timing allowed for a full 10 months to get ready for the Hawaiian Ironman. But what I hadn't factored in is that bouncing back from a baby at age 43 is a little bit harder than bouncing back when you're 37 years old. However, there was another issue that almost derailed me right before the race. I had weaned my son right before I got on the plane to fly to Hawaii, um, but my left breast somehow didn't get the message. And uh, in the days leading up to race, my left breast was very swollen and painful. And I started to get worried as race day approached. So I finally talked to a Hawaiian local woman who pointed me to a, a Hawaiian um, healer. And what she recommended was that I put a cabbage leaf in my bra. And I thought, okay. And she said, oh, you'll be fine. Don't worry. I said, okay. So optimistically, I bought myself a cabbage, took a leaf off, <laughs> put it in my bra, and I went off to the carbo load dinner, which was two days before the race. Uh, halfway through the dinner, all of a sudden, I started to get a little bit like dizzy and kind of um, nauseous. And I thought, oh my God, I think it's this cabbage leaf. <laughs> and so I took it out and I slipped it into my salad. No, no, no. I actually, I actually threw it out in the bathroom. But lo and behold, the next morning, voila, my left and right sisters were the same size and pain free. So somehow or rather, the cabbage leaf worked, and I have since looked it up on the internet, and indeed, cabbage leaves are a treatment for mastitis and engorgement. So there you go. <laughs>
<laughs> so my late 40s was when I finally had to start to concede that age-related decline, though it can be slowed and delayed, is eventually inevitable. So in my training in racing, I started focusing on not getting slower rather than trying to get faster. And that change in goals was kind of necessary to not get frustrated at a lack of progress. And I have to say, racing against the age curve is kind of fun. And it's an everlasting goal. You will never end. <laughs> so eventually I transitioned to the next phase of a woman's life, menopause. So the onset of menopause brings more changes to the body, hot flashes, loss of muscle, and like it seems like every other stage of a woman's life, weight gain. So one of the main impediments to performance at this time are the hot flashes. So these are these intense changes in body temperature that feel like a furnace has just been flicked on inside your body and it causes you to finally break out into a whole body sweat. And the problem is that these occur often many times per night when you're trying to sleep and recover from training. And it's a real interruption. And once it happens, you often have to get up and change your pajamas several times per night or lay down a towel on your wet sheet just to get back to sleep. So it can be very <laughs> interruptive. I soon discovered for me, though, that I would often wake up just as the furnace turned on inside, and if I just quickly kicked all my covers off and, and just exposed all my bare skin to the air, that often the worst of it would be just evaporate into the air, and very soon I would get cold from all the evaporation, which would trigger me to want to cuddle back up in my covers and go back to sleep. So that's how I handled it. As for the muscle loss, well, weight training can definitely combat that. And um, that's something that's a work in progress for me. And um, I'm very optimistic that I'm going to get into a real routine for that in the future. <laughs> uh, so I'm still writing the story of being postmenopausal, but I can already tell you that it's absolutely going to require that I keep my sense of humor. <laughs> so as I recount the challenges of racing while female, some themes emerge, and these actually apply to both genders. Number one, our bodies are amazing and they're capable of great things no matter what phase of life we're in. Two, our bodies are constantly changing and we're going to have to constantly pay attention and also adapt. Third, knowledge is power. Seek it out from many different sources, including Hawaiian shamans. <laughs> and finally, always maintain your optimism. So let's continue to share information, not be afraid or embarrassed to talk about our anatomy and quirks, and insist that research featuring female athletes is increased and the results shared widely with athletes, coaches, and professional uh, medical professionals. Though we are breast developing, menstruating, baby producing, nursing, menopausal, and postmenopausal women, we are above all badass female athletes. <laughs> Thank you.